microplastics, you can't burn those out of your body, right? Your body doesn't metabolize microplastics and use them for energy. So when you get a bunch of this stuff in your arteries, it makes it much more challenging to get it out, right? You, now you've got more permanent plaque in your arteries. It's been a big problem, but now that they're finally doing more research studies on it, they're finding it's, oh, it's oops, it's a bigger problem than we thought. Welcome to the Seamland Podcast. Our guest today is Dr. Anthony J. Anthony has a PhD in biochemistry and he has worked as a scientific researcher at the Mayo Clinic. Anthony wrote the book Estrogeneration that talks about the dangers of microplastics and other hormone disruptors in our environment. Anthony, welcome back to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. Yeah, like we did our first podcast, uh, yeah, like we talked about previously that five years ago, uh, which is, has been already like a long time since uh, the last time we sp spoke. But uh, the reason I wanted to bring you back on was because recently there's been a lot of, uh, let's say, new studies about the dangers of uh, microplastics and xenoestrogens uh, in our environment. And for the, for, the, for the listener, then, you know, the most recent study was in like a few months ago, and they found that like this microplastics accumulated in the arteries were like linked to a higher risk of uh, cardiovascular events and cardiovascular death. So that, that's obviously like rings a lot of alarm bells for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And you're pretty much one of the like world's leading experts on xenoestrogens and microplastics. So, and you've written a book about it as well. So I'm like happy to have you back on and talk about all things uh, microplastics. <laughs> Yeah, man. Thanks. And it, it's interesting because it ties into intermittent fasting too. You're still talking a lot about intermittent fasting, I assumed with people. Yeah. Well, I'm doing it myself and I do cover oh, yeah. it often. Yeah. Yeah. Same. I, I usually do a six hour feeding window. In fact, I've been doing that every day for like 40 years, to be honest. Oh, for um, 40 years. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And I was doing it before it was like a thing, you know, because I have so many right. gut issues and I just found accidentally discovered that just really helps my gut issues. Mm. Um, but the reason I bring that up is because, you know, fasting increases autophagy, which is basically cells taking out trash, as you know, mm. and you can think of these microplastics in our bodies as a type of trash, right? It's, it's basically garbage. It's actually worse than that because, you know, if your cell is burning sugar and you get metabolic trash, you get garbage from, it, it's kind of like if you're, if you're running a diesel truck. And you get garbage, you know, you get that black smoke coming out the back. It's dirty, but, and that happens when your cells are burning energy, but at least it's natural, right? It's like something your body is adapted for and you can clean out some of that garbage. The problem with microplastics, our ancestors were never exposed to these things. These are completely artificial, never found in nature historically. So our bodies aren't adapted for burning that type of trash, right? But autophagy still helps clear it out, right? I mean, it doesn't stay in your body forever. Your body still gets rid of that stuff. Mm. But it's just interesting timing because, as you know, a couple of weeks ago, there was a quote-unquote study. It's complete nonsense. But they said that intermittent fasting raises heart disease 91%, which was complete nonsense. Right. <laughs> it wasn't even a study. It was just a phone call questionnaire. But what was really interesting, Seem, was... um. And are, do you release the videos or these, or are these just yeah, I, audio? I did, I did um, make a video about that topic, uh, but uh, you can still cover it. Yeah, exactly. Well, can, do you, when we, when you release this, is it going to be a video? Uh, or is yeah. it audio only? No, it's a video as well. Can you allow me to share the screen? I'll share my screen on a, a study and I'll talk about it too, in case people are just listening to the audio. Yeah, you can do it now. I should have asked you to do it before we talked, but I was kind of running late. So I'm sharing my screen and it says, this is an umbrella review. If people want to look it up, it's called an umbrella review of systematic reviews and meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials of intermittent fasting. This was mm -hmm. like two weeks before that study. You know, that's whole 91% increase in heart disease from intermittent fasting. Yeah. This umbrella review that I have on the screen, you could see it, right, Sim? Yeah. Yeah. This was released, as you can see, uh, in April of 2024. And this is a real umbrella review of intermittent fasting. And what did they find? They find basically intermittent fasting IF reduced waist circumference, right? It's, uh, it reduced fat mass, like people got leaner. It reduced insulin. It reduced some aspects of cholesterol. Like literally 
the only thing that it increased was free fat mass, which means your body's burning fats better when you're intermittent fasting. <laughs> like literally this study, I think they had like 300 uh, randomized control trials that they were re reviewing in this study. Yeah. This was published like two weeks before that phone call questionnaire study that made such big headlines and nobody talked about it. Like the American Heart Association said absolutely nothing about this umbrella review. Yeah. And yet this was an actual study, right? Like they actually were pulling together a bunch of studies and I just quit the screen share there. But yeah, um, yeah I guess that's the other problem with these uh, epidemiological studies that a lot of them are based on this. You know, the, the scientist uh, calls the person like twice over the course of four years and asks, OK, what exactly. did you eat last last week? Whereas the exactly. randomized, randomized controlled trials are a bit more like, you know, more, uh, let's say, intensive in terms of the uh, controlling for the variables and uh, like measuring the outcomes. Yeah, and it's not just that. There's an actual agenda. Basically, food companies want to sell more products. Breakfast foods are profitable. They're addictive because they have a lot of carbs in a lot of cases and a lot of other nonsense. And so there's behind the scenes, there's a lot of funding and agendas, especially with the American Heart Association, because they were the ones that were really promoting this study that said intermittent fasting increases heart disease by 91%. So the first thing I want to say about microplastics is don't be afraid of intermittent fasting that <laughs> this whole fear mongering about intermittent fasting causing heart disease is complete nonsense. It's just straight up lying to people, right. in my opinion. I mean, you can you can do questionnaire studies and make any results you want for any topic that you want. I mean, mm. we see it with red meat all the time. We see it with all kinds of different topics. Um, it's frustrating. It's challenging to deal with, but that's just the way it works in science. You know, sometimes yeah. people make up studies with, the, sure. you know, with a goal in mind to kind of manipulate things. Mm. Now, in terms of microplastics, you know, a lot of people, they don't realize that, um, you know, artery plaque, plaque in people's arteries is actually made up of cholesterol. Like if you do an autopsy on somebody, most of the plaque is cholesterol. It's there. It is in the plaque, right? Um, and I always describe it like a firefighter. You know, like if you have a house on fire, you have a bunch of firefighters there. It doesn't mean they're causing the fire, but they are there. Cholesterol doesn't cause plaques, but it is in the plaque. Right. Right. So the only way to get rid of uh, plaque in your arteries, if people have plaque in their arteries, I've seen people reverse plaque in their arteries. I'm sure you have too. Um, and I've been doing DNA consulting for like 10 years, as you probably know. I was probably doing it. I, talked to, I might have talked about it the last time we talked. But, you know, when you look at people's genetics and you understand what's going on with their diet and their exercise and their sleep and all this stuff, and you get people to go from... Uh, poor health state to a healthy state, they can reverse plaque. Like you can, you don't just stop plaque from getting worse in people's arteries. You actually reverse plaque, right? And the only way to do that, remember plaque is cholesterol. There's a few other things in there like microplastics, which we're going to talk about in a minute, but plaque is mainly cholesterol. The only way to burn fat, you know, cholesterol is fat, right? It's a lipid. It's like butter. Butter floats on water. It's a lipid. The only way to burn that stuff out of your arteries is to teach your body to burn fats. It's the only way to do it, right? You can't burn cholesterol out of your arteries by eating sugar all the time because then your body just preferentially burns sugar. You never teach your body to burn fats. Plaque stays in your arteries forever, literally. Now, there's also some calcium in people's plaques, and there's also, and you can pick that up on a CAC scan, right? There's a lot of other components to artery plaque, but cholesterol is the main component. And again, if you want to burn plaque out of your arteries, you have to teach your body to burn fast. Now, the problem with microplastics, to bring it all the way back, I know this was a long circle, but microplastics, you can't burn those out of your body, right? Your body doesn't metabolize microplastics and use them for energy. Right. So when you get a bunch of this stuff in your arteries, it makes it much more challenging to get it out, right? You, now you've got more permanent plaque in your arteries. And that's why it's a concern. And of course, they're finding it in uh, placentas and they're finding it in just all over the place. I mean, basically anywhere you check in people's bodies, you're finding microplastics because these things are everywhere. I wrote about it in my book, Estro Generation, as you mentioned, but it's been a big problem. But now that they're finally doing more research studies on it, they're finding it's, oh, it's oops, it's a bigger problem than we thought. Right.
Yeah. So uh, obviously the we can we can establish some sort of like um, let's say uh, I guess like how do, how do we proceed from here like in terms of like okay uh, the the you know microplastics are almost like or, or not not everyone had plaque or the microplastics in the arteries in that study like there was a, a certain amount of people and those people had the highest risk of these uh, cardiovascular disease events so I guess the question might be that is it causal that the microplastics in the arteries are increasing the risk of the events or is it more of like you know correlated with uh, that uh, people who have more microplastics in the arteries or, or already are at a higher risk of a heart disease yeah. and uh, they have other health problems with which then increases the risk of the the bad outcomes probably both number one it probably increases heart heart attacks because it makes the plaque less stable mm. the plaque is less stable then chunks of the chunks of that plaque are going to come off they're going to shear off and they're going to end up you know literally causing clotting that triggers heart attacks so that's the first thing it probably causes now we don't know again the research is pretty new but that's almost for sure it's almost certainly increasing heart attacks in a direct way from causing plaques to be less stable and right. tr messing with your immune system triggering your immune system which again it's not supposed it's not used to seeing plastic you know our genetics aren't adapted from thousands of years of plastic exposure so of course your immune system is going to react in a negative way um, and trigger extra inflammation so that's the first thing i do think it causes increased heart attacks but also i think it's also associated higher with higher heart attacks because people that are exposed to more plastics are eating more nonsense more processed foods you know they're not paying attention to their health as much so there's probably that aspect too, right? Where they don't exercise as much, they eat more shenanigans. So I think it's both. <laughs> right. The problem is also that the environment is so full of them, like they're everywhere. And like virtually everyone, even if you are eating, like following a healthy lifestyle and stuff, even then you're exposed to them somewhere. <laughs> like whether that be oh, yeah. some, uh, you know, house, chemi house cleaning chemicals, personal care products, uh water bottles you know even the air so yeah it's it's very hard to like you know fully avoid them yeah that's why intermittent fasting is so important right when people are attacking intermittent fasting it's so frustrating because it's more important now than ever and i think our ancestors were doing it for thousands of years there's good evidence in most people's genetics some people have good genes for eating breakfast and i'm okay with that right like eat your three meals a day or whatever but most people have a bunch of adiponectin genes and a bunch of other genes related like autophagy genes that are very important for their thyroid or for whatever right. and intermittent fasting is something they need to be doing especially today <clears throat> right. to help get rid of this junk from your body but the other problem too is the microplastics are one thing but plastic in general almost always has either bpa or phthalates right and sometimes it's not BPA, it's BPS or BPF or BPAF, whatever, bisphenols. They call them bisphenols. Um, but most people are familiar with BPA. And these plastics are full of these chemicals, BPA, phthalates, BPS. And those chemicals alter your hormones. They mess, they act like estrogen in your body. That's why I call I call them estrogenics, because they trigger your estrogen receptor, which ultimately lowers your testosterone. And as you probably know, testosterone is very protective for your arteries. So it's kind of a lose, lose, lose when you have these microplastics because that physically they build up in the body, they build up in the plaques. They, right, like we talked about, you know, the association and the cause of heart disease. And again, it's not super well studied, but there's enough hints in the research that I'm pretty confident that that's what we're seeing. But then also it messes with your testosterone, and testosterone is protective for your arteries. So, if you have a little bit of damage to your arteries, uh, your body can heal. You know, it's not like your body, like if you scrape your knee, your body heals. Um, and that happens all the time. But if your testosterone is low, your healing is very slow. So it takes longer to heal. You don't heal as thoroughly. You don't heal as quickly. And so, you know, testosterone is very cardio protective. And they've done studies with like 80,000 people that are on TRT and they have far less heart disease than people that are have low testosterone. 
Mm. Um, so testosterone is very important for, for protecting against heart disease and all kinds of other things, obviously helps mm. your mood and improves people's, it, it, it sometimes fixes people's depression and gets rid of their depression or it just improves their mood. It usually makes them want to exercise more. So then they go to the gym and ultimately that leads to better health. Right. So there's a lot of kind of side benefits, you know, like when you take prescription drugs, there's side effects. When you, when you increase your testosterone, whether it's through some TRT or actually just boosting it by getting rid of plastic out of your body, because those plastics are suppressing your testosterone. Anytime you increase your testosterone, I mean, within reason, you don't want to overdose it and things like that and abuse it. But anytime you increase it within a reasonable level, you're just generally improving your health. And that's mm. part of the story with the microplastics and the estrogens and the BP. I mean, the consumer reports, I did a YouTube video on the consumer reports study where they, in America here, they went to the grocery store and they tested hmm, well over a hundred foods. I can't remember the exact number, but they tested, I think I want to say hundreds of foods, but I can't remember again, I've done a video on it with the details, but, uh, over 75% of foods in the grocery store had BPA and everybody knows BPA is bad. Like everybody agrees. And you know what they said? They said, that's an improvement from 2014 when they did this study before, because when they did the study before, it was like 95% of foods had BPA and now it's 75. And I said, 75% is terrible. Like that's really high. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think 99% had phthalates. Almost everything had phthalates and some foods were really, really high levels of phthalates, which both, both are bad. BPA is bad. Phthalates are bad. They act like estrogen. They lower your testosterone. So it's still very, very pervasive and a lot of awareness needs to be raised. And like you said, you're always going to have some exposure because of atmospheric microplastics and water, And but you can filter your water. You can buy personal care products without fragrances and without phthalates and BPA, you can find them. There's plenty of them out there. Um, and so you're going to get a little exposure, but then if you sweat, you sweat these out. If you exercise, it helps move more blood through your body. Exercise increases detoxification because your, your blood is going through your liver more frequently and your liver helps clear the stuff out and your kidneys. So there's, there's strategies you can use that are just basic, you know, intermittent fast, get out in the sunshine, exercise, right? Sunshine breaks down plastics right it breaks down microplastic aggregates remember like think of microplastics as like thousands of little particles that are aggregating together in your body when you have these plaques right um that happens right these things stick to each other they they attract each other they're hy they're hydrophobic um so or i'm sorry they're hydrophilic they love they love to stick together philic means philos in greek means love right hmm. um and so Oh yeah, they're hydro. I mean, whatever. They're 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 similar properties to each other. That's what I mean to say. Uh, they're they're like you know they're like estrogen, right? Um, and they aggregate together, and sunshine helps break aggregates up, right? If you have too much bilirubin in your body, you have some bilirubin genes. There's a gene called UGT one A one. It means you have a high risk of too much bilirubin. And what's bilirubin? It's like chunks of red blood cells, and people get too much red blood cells you know, built up in their body. And what's the solution? Well, you get out in the sun. It's that simple. Even if you're born with jaundice because you have this genetic issue, this UGT1A1 gene, you can, you can be born with kind of yellow skin and you got too much bilirubin in your body. You know what the conventional doctors do? Even the conventional doctors, they put you under a UV lamp. They put babies under a UV light to break up the bilirubin, mm. right? You've probably heard of that with babies and jaundice. Um, mm. And again, that's kind of a genetic issue. I look for that when I look at people's genetics, but the same thing happens with tattoos. When people have tattoos and they go in the sun all the time, the tattoo fades away because the ink starts to break down. Microplastics, same thing happens. You can't see it. You don't feel it as much, you know, you don't notice it, but it's happening. Your body's breaking down these, your sunshine is helping your body break down these microplastic right. aggregates. So sunshine, exercise, intermittent fasting do it all right like use utilize all the tools because we live in kind of a, an unusually toxic environment mm. for our hormones and you want your hormones to be amazing you want your health to be amazing yeah
Well, uh, that's pretty interesting. Like I've uh, all talked often about saunas and exercise and those kind of things for uh, like excreting them, but the sunlight, I didn't know uh, about that, which is, uh, yeah, <laughs> pretty interesting. So like you would want to, I guess, you know, direct skin contact with the sun would be the required. Yeah, exactly. And of course, don't get burned, right? I mean, people right. overdo it and then that's terrible. So there's always a fine line between overdoing something and not doing enough, but it's like exercise, right? I mean, if you're, if you're overtraining, it's bad for you, but obviously exercise is good for you. Sometimes people say, oh, sunshine is bad for you. And it's like, well, that's not sunshine. That's overdoing sunshine. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Same, water can be also bad for you. In <laughs> yeah. Months. Interestingly, peptides could be the future of longevity supplements. One of the most evidence-based peptides for skin aging is copper peptide GHK. Copper is needed for collagen and elastin synthesis as well as collagen uptake into cells. Copper peptide GHK has been found to modulate skin regeneration and wound healing. In diabetic humans, GHK has been seen to speed up skin healing from ulcers by threefold. GHK copper peptide also modulates antioxidant genes that protect against inflammation, UVB radiation and oxidative stress. So copper peptide GHK helps with collagen synthesis, it helps with skin regeneration, wound healing and skin elasticity. I've been using the Alitura Gold Serum for over a year. The Gold Serum has GHK copper tripeptide that helps with skin regeneration, pigmentation and elasticity. There's also other amazing natural food grade ingredients like marine collagen, organic olive oil, plant retinol, astaxanthin, bee propolis, beeswax, coq10 essential oils and hemp seed oil, all of which support collagen synthesis and skin health. All Alitura skincare products are made of natural ingredients with no microplastics or hormone disruptors, unlike conventional brands. Their products are also bottled in Myron glass, free from xenoestrogens and plastics. This makes the gold serum the most unique and powerful skin serum you can use, and I'm personally taking it daily. There are hundreds of positive testimonials and reviews you can check out on the Alitura website for some amazing skin transformations. Use code SEAM for a 20% discount at alitura.com. Yeah, you mentioned that you know the, most of the foods in the supermarket have like uh, the microplastics and phthalates. So uh, another recent study, I guess, maybe, I don't know if it was 2024 or 2023, but uh, they looked at the proteins in the supermarkets and like 90% of the proteins had microplastics in them because, you know, they're packaged in the, in the plastic container uh, mm -hmm. and uh, wrapping so that the moisture in the meat or uh, fish or whatever it is, then that's going to leach some of the microplastics in there. And what they found was that the more processed the food was, like chicken nuggets and those kind of things, the, the, the more microplastics it contained. Whereas like yeah. regular cords or regular meat, uh, unprocessed, it had less. But, you know, they all had certain amounts because of just being packaged in the uh, plastic uh, wrap. Yeah, it makes sense, right? It's not that complicated. Um even when there's barely any research done, sometimes if you just use common sense, it's like, well, of course, the more processed the food is, the more microplastic. But it's nice to see the studies, right? Yeah. Because, you know, 10 years ago, there was just barely hints of some of this stuff. There was hardly any studies. Nobody was interested in it. And part of the problem, Sim, is when scientists do toxicology studies, they're researching toxins. There's kind of this model that says, you know, and by the way, I have poison ivy in case your viewers are wondering, like, why is his hand all like bumpy right here? Uh, it's distracting hope, to me. So hopefully it's not distracting to people. But if it is, um, but yeah, I totally lost my train of thought. I saw my poison ivy and I got distracted. <laughs> Just in <laughs> my you're mentioning the toxicology when exactly. I'm sorry. Yeah. So when they when they've done traditional toxicology in scientific research studies, they're looking at doses of chemicals that kill cells. They have cells growing in a dish, and they're putting BPA in there. They're putting mercury in there. They're putting lead or cobalt or chromium or cadmium or whatever chemicals they're making up artificially, like polyethylene glycol or whatever. They're putting chemicals in those on those cells. And the cells grow in liquid that kind of imitate people's blood, but they're putting the chemicals in there and they're saying, oh, it takes this dose to kill half of them. It's called an LD50, right? They're looking for a toxic dose. The problem is if you have BPA or if you have phthalates, 
those act like estrogen. So they're not that toxic, you know, so they don't kill cells the same way that mercury would. So they don't appear to be very toxic. So they're kind of sneaky because a lot of scientists, especially 10 years ago, they would say, oh, those chemicals are totally fine. You need to eat like a pound of, or a kilogram of it to kill yourself and that kind of thing. Like, yeah, sure. You know, it takes a lot to kill somebody. But once your hormones get disrupted, now all of a sudden you have long-term health issues, right? Your body's not healing from training very well. Your sleep gets disrupted. Progesterone is very important for sleep, especially after menopause. But even for men, it's important. Testosterone is obviously important for everything. You know, on and on and on. You could talk about once you disrupt your sex hormones, your health just starts to steadily and slowly decline. And so it's not killing people. It's not toxic, right? But it's it's something that people need to be paying attention to. Mm. What is the LD fifty of the BPA or something? Then do you know <laughs> how much would you have yeah. to like ingest in one sitting? It's a lot. It's a, it's a lot. But I can't remember honestly. Mm. Um, I pr I probably wrote about it very specifically in my book, but my you know my book was published in twenty seventeen. Yeah. Um, and I'm a, I'm I'm a the problem is literally nanograms can impact your health because our our hormones are at nanogram levels right um and nanogram is 10 to the minus ninth nine grams right it's point zero 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 one grams that's a nanogram hmm. so we're talking about tiny tiny minuscule amounts in fact you know 80 years 50 years ago 80 years ago when they were researching testosterone in women they didn't even think women had testosterone because it's at such a low level. Women have testosterone. It's very important for women, but it's tenfold less than men's testosterone. And even men's testosterone 50 years ago was difficult to measure because it's in nanograms. You know what I mean? So um, it's and that's one of the ways they used to deny that microplastics or BPA was in they when when they first invented BPA. It was actually created as birth control. There was a researcher named uh, Charles Edward Dodds, D-O-D-D-S, Dodds. And he he was using a compound called diethylstilbestrol, DES, D-E-S, which is a hormone-disrupting chemical. They used to prescribe it to women for morning sickness. Millions of women, literally millions of women were prescribed DES, D-E-S. And it causes a bunch of birth defects, and sometimes it causes miscarriages so they're giving women a drug for morning sickness and then they cause miscarriages right real bad problems and they made it illegal in the 1970s but for like 30 years they prescribed this chemical to women but that was the precursor they used deaths to make bpa right so this hormone disrupting chemical deaths was the uh parent compound of bpa and then they discovered that bpa can be used to make plastics and then they said, oh, forget about the birth control thing. Let's do the plastics thing. And they convinced everybody that it does not leach. They said, look, we can make plastic bottles out of this. It doesn't leach. It's okay. It's totally safe. And even if it does leach, it takes a kilogram to kill people. So they're totally fine, right? Or whatever it takes to kill people. Um, and then, of course, as we've been, as we've, as science has become better at um, measuring nanogram levels of substances, we realize like there's a lot of leaching. And it's at levels that are very comparable to our hormone levels. When we're drinking out of these plastic bottles, it raises your blood levels of these estrogen mimicking chemicals, these estrogenics, these BPAs and these phthalates that end up in your blood. They, they're at levels that are very comparable to your hormones. So in other words, they're acting like hormones. They're completely disrupting all the normal pathways between all your different hormones. And it's complicated because some people handle it okay and some people handle it very poorly because different people have different genetics. But the point is, Nobody wants their hormones disrupted. And these chemicals do that at very, very low doses at nanogram levels. And it's been a, a fight to, to raise that awareness throughout the years because there's a lot of denial about the effects mm. on people's health. And it takes a longer time to see hormone problems, right? Like if you, if you take, if you disrupt your estrogen, if you cut, if you increase your estrogen, or as a man, if you decrease your testosterone, you know, let's say you decrease your testosterone 20% for 10 years, that's going to cause health problems, you know, in the population, if you decrease men's testosterone 20%, but it might take 
five years before you notice those health problems, right? So it's a slow, it's, a, it's hard to pick it up. You pick it, you can pick it up. It's there. It's been there for the last 10 years. You can see it in the research if you pay attention, but it's, it's not something that people were really tuned into, you know, for a long time. Mm. Right. When did they appear, the microplastics, like, I guess, after World War II or? Yeah, as soon as plastics were invented. I mean, you know, obviously they weren't looking for them when they first invented these things. But it's funny, I was just watching this morning, I was watching a video of uh, people, there was a machine, you can take a plastic bottle, like from a recycling facility, and you put it through this grinder, and it grinds it up into little tiny plastic particles. And then it uh, and then it like turns it into cotton candy. It looks like cotton candy. If people Google like cotton candy plastics, they'll see it literally like fluffs. It, it turns it into a fabric. And then they were taking it and spinning it into like a fabric for making clothing. And then they were, it was all one step. It was all one process. They would like put the plastic bottles in this machine. It would turn it into cotton candy. The cotton candy would get turned into thread and the thread would be spun into clothing. And mm. so and they're bragging about it. they're saying like this is such a good thing it's a great use of plastic waste and <laughs> and i'm just thinking of all the phthalates that people are sweating on you know in their clothing when they're wearing things like that and so it's it's just an, a level of awareness that people didn't have 10 years ago and the more you watch out for it the more the more research they do on it the the more you recognize that it is bad it's there in the research you know some of it's not very well studied some of it is but you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's a problem. Mm. Yeah. It's like the, uh, what's the, like, yeah, like this kind of gym compression clothes or those kind of things. Yeah. Yeah. Those yeah. Polyester. Of, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's the word polyester, the full term it's called P E T E. That's the abbreviation P E T E polyethylene terra phthalate. It's got the word phthalate in it. It's got phthalates attached to every molecule of polyethylene. Um, so, you know, again, like, have they done a whole bunch of studies researching how much leaching happens from clothing? Not really, not yet. They will give it a few years and all of a sudden you're going to find a bunch of negative studies, right? It's stuff is so predictable, Seem It's just unbelievable that, you know, it takes as long as it does to get these studies done and to find out this information. But again, it's very predictable. It's common sense. If you're wearing clothing that's made out of plastics, that's full of phthalates, and, you know, <laughs> and you're sweating a lot and you're, especially if it's underwear, like me personally, I just wear cotton underwear, cotton clothes underneath. It's okay to have some polyester, right? It's not that big of a deal, but if you're constantly wearing underwear or if your sheets, your bed sheets, that's what I tell people in my book, watch out for bed sheets and, and especially your pillowcases because you're breathing onto your pillowcase every night. I mean, there's actual studies they've done on baby, baby mattresses that infants sleep on. That are made from plastic they they coat the baby mattresses with plastic because if because babies wet the bed right and so there's actual studies and again i cite these in my book where just the off gassing like the air has so much plastic off gas uh substance that it raises the baby's cancer risk in a noticeable way like you can actually pick up more cancer in those infants which is crazy because infants don't usually get cancer. It's a very rare thing for babies to have cancer and infants and children in general um, because their metabolism is so high and their body bounces back from injury and inflammation so well compared to older people. But it's increasing cancer. That's how bad the levels are. So, you know, it's worth, like I say, it's worth paying attention to at every level. If, if you have plastics in your environment, try and minimize them. You're never going to fully get them out. So you still have to intermittent fast. You still have to exercise. You still have to do basic things, but minimize, right? Mm. Yeah. And uh, I guess one of the more, there's a common saying that you people ingest like a credit card size of the microplastics every year. So is that correct? And, uh, you know, how big is the microplastic itself, like a single particle? <laughs> yeah, well, when they measure micro right that's different than nano it's like three three zeros three orders of magnitude and less than a nanoparticle but there's nanoparticles of plastics also mm. it's not just micro people use the term microplastics because it's it's memorable it sounds good it's it's you know 
It's researched because it's easy to pick up microplastics. It's harder to pick up nanoplastics, but they're there as well. And again, it's not even just nano. It's even smaller than that because you have molecules of phthalates. And they've done dermal absorption studies, kind of going back to the clothing and stuff. By the way, if you look up the term dermal absorption, you can find like oxybenzone, like sunscreen molecules get picked up through your skin and phthalates go through the skin just from like laundry detergent fragrances and things like that, like really smelly clothing. When you wear that stuff, it goes through your skin. It raises your blood levels, dermal absorption, skin absorption. Um, But yeah, you know, again, like it's hard because microplastics, they're pretty easy to see under a microscope. So they, they're the ones that make the headlines and they're the ones that they actually find in people's arteries and they find in their heart and they find in the baby's placentas and they find all over the place in people's bodies in the brain, right? It's crossing the blood brain barrier. It's pretty much everywhere. I mean, you can, you can, if you're looking for it, you're going to find it as, as pervasive as these things are in our culture. But I'm actually more worried about the phthalates, you know, like the the molecules that are disrupting our hormones, um, mm. because they're I think they're a lot more insidious than the microplastics, the credit card, and I think it's a credit card per month or something, or maybe per week. I can't remember the number. Okay. I know what you're talking about, but I can. I mean, maybe fact check, you know, and just go to Google and say like credit card microplastics, and it probably I think it was like per week, um, or it was much more mm. frequent than per year. It's a lot. Like people are getting a ton of microplastics. Um, but again, it's, it's way beyond also, that. You can also like reduce the burden, get them out a bit. Dramatically. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And remember fat cells, you know, our, the average lifespan of a fat cell is 10 years. They've done atomic bomb studies. I've done YouTube videos on these and sh- I show the actual studies. 10 years, the average fat cell. And so it takes a long time sometimes to flush things out of your, 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 your fat cells store a lot of these chemicals. Like we were talking about at the beginning with your artery walls and plaque in your arteries and cholesterol in the plaque. Cholesterol is a type of fat, right? Um, these microplastics, they store up in the fat. These phthalates especially store up in the fat. They're just like hormones, right? They float on water. They're, like I said, they're hydrophobic. Um, you know, so they're, they're going to last a long time in your system. So anything you can do to accelerate the process, number one, getting rid of fat cells, like having good body mass, staying lean, exercising, going keto once in a while, intermittent fasting all the time. You know, again, for women, it's a little more complicated because their period and stuff. Sometimes they need to eat more meals per day around the time of their period. It, they just do better with that. But the point is, You know, anything that's conducive to burning fat and helping your body flush these chemicals out, I think it's imperative. You have to do it these days. Right. Gotcha. I also found one study that uh, they had like these firefighters and they did blood uh, donation on them and uh, that reduced the amount of these uh, forever chemicals, Ah. the PFAS uh, levels, which is another like category, I guess. And the funny part about it was that, you know, if you're doing blood donation, then you're giving it to someone else. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. <laughs> giving the <laughs> microplastics to someone else. So it's, you know, yeah. I mean, uh, I guess then like all donated, all blood donation nowadays contains uh, microplastics. So like if you're getting yeah. or if you're donating blood or getting donated blood, you're getting uh, microplastics uh, from there anyway. Yeah, it's a problem. And, and it's, you know... When people have really high ferritin levels, when they have too much iron in their blood because of genetics, like hemochromatosis genes and things, um, they don't, they have to donate blood to get the iron out, but it's the same problem. You're giving people like you're giving, you're donating a really, really high iron blood. Yeah. Um, but at least if you're, if you're in a dire situation where you need blood desperately and you're dying from bleeding out, it's okay to get a dose of a little bit of extra stuff for one time, you know? Right. Um, because it it saves your life so it's like well yes it's less healthy (laughs) than it could be but and by the way there's a lot of doctors that if you know if you have hemochromatosis where your iron is too high or if you're a firefighter where you have too many of these you know toxic smoke chemicals um these aromatic hydrocarbons and things in your blood they just throw the blood they discard the blood Mm. you know they you can still donate blood 
So right. find a doctor that will still take your blood and they just throw it in the sink. And mm. it's worth doing. You know, it's actually one of the ways you can help kind of change your oil, right? You get some of this garbage out of your system um, because again, it stays in your system a long time. That's where the sauna really, really helps, right? Because heat speeds up molecular movement. So if you use something that's hot, you know, like you're in a hot environment, um, your every molecule in your body moves quicker. It's kind of like a if you're boiling water, the steam comes off the top because the molecules are moving faster, and some of those water molecules, those H two H two O molecules, are flying off the surface, and they're turning into steam. Same thing happens inside your body with your fat cells. A lot of these estrogen chemicals are f- moving around quicker. They're c- going in and out of these cells. They're getting into your blood. Your blood is flushing them out. You're pissing them out. Your liver is able to detoxify them instead of staying in there for 10 years. Hmm. So the key is to like uh, stimulate the uh, lymphatic system, the the uh, fat oxidation and uh, you know blood flow or those, those kind of things as well. Well, in, in all while you're avoiding the chemicals. Yeah. So <laughs> stop ingesting them and then flush out the ones you have. And it, you know, an average fat cell lives 10 years apparently, but they turn over every year and a half. So the fat cell itself can be 10 years old on average, but the actual fats inside the fat cell turn over about every year and a half. So if you have these chemicals in your body, you don't have to think about it as a 10 year problem. Think about it as like a, a year and a half problem. And if you use the sauna, it might be any exercise more and you eat healthy and things and you go into ketosis once in a while, or you're intermittent fast, it might take six months to clear these things out of your body, mm. which isn't that unreasonable considering that you're prob most people are probably exposed their entire lives. So six months to get rid of, you know, all this junk is a pretty, it's, it's actually pretty positive. You know, that's a good thing. Mm. Very, it is reversible. Right. Is there like a way to measure the amount of microplastics in your body? Is there any biomarkers that kind of reflect it or? Oh yeah. The, the, the company right now, have you heard of mosaic diagnostics? Uh, no, they used to be called great plains labs and it's the only company in America right now they're developing. So in research studies, I've used to do a lot of research studies. I worked at Mayo Clinic for a lot of years and places like that, Boston University Medical School. In research studies, we have the capacity to measure phthalates and BPA and oxybenzone and all these different benzophenones, all these different estrogen mimicking chemicals. The problem is there's not a consumer test. You can't just go to your doctor and say, I want to measure my phthalates or my oxybenzone from sunscreen or whatever. So that's the first thing. There is nothing for normal people, unless you're involved in a research study and you've got a ridiculous amount of access to high technology, but the great plains lab, again, it's now they changed their name to mosaic diagnostics. They've developed their, they have developed a uh, consumer uh, blood test that you can just, you know, you get a doctor to sign a note for you. They draw your blood, they send it to the mosaic diagnostics. But I don't think it's on the market until the end of this summer. So a couple months away, it's not far off. I've talked to the chief scientific officer at their company. In fact, they wanted they wanted me to be involved in a lot of the different aspects of it. And I I was involved in a little bit, but I'm just glad the company's doing it. They're doing a good job. I don't need to be involved, but I am happy to promote the tasks that they're developing. And I don't make any money from promoting it, by the way. It's just it's about time that we have something like that. You know, it's good. It's a good right. thing, but that's the only thing that I know of on the market for measuring your phthalates and things like that. The mosaic diagnostics. Gotcha. Yeah. I've also heard or did some research online that like blood antimony levels might be like reflecting some aspects of the microplastics. I might be wrong, but uh, I did a blood test and it showed that or it, it had uh, antimony in the panel. So I was like, okay, what is this marker? I've never heard of it before. And I, at least on Google, it said that it can reflect some microplastic uh, status. I don't know if it's accurate, but. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, I don't know either. I've never heard about it, but um, yeah, the more, I mean, the other one, the one I usually use, I tell people just check your testosterone, men and women, check your testosterone because I've seen people dramatically. In fact, I did a podcast with a guy from uh, the UK and he, 
wasn't a big believer in the whole plastics and you know he, he didn't think it was worth worrying about you know people from the uk are very skeptical especially and they're proud proud of being extra skeptical and and he said look let me do six weeks i'm going to check my testosterone right now today and then i'm going to get i'm going to get all my plastic bottles out of my life i'm not going to drink anything out of plastic i'm going to filter all my water i'm going to get rid of my personal care products that have fragrances basically he he wanted to go completely on the extreme of avoiding estrogen mimicking chemicals and he his testosterone went up 25 percent in six weeks and he became a big believer because he's it's been like three years since we did that podcast and he still has maintained amazing testosterone hmm. um and 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 he's a healthy guy right before he was healthy after he was healthy he didn't change his diet and he was very specific about not changing anything else because again he was pretty dialed in but imagine what you can do if you don't exercise and then you start exercising you don't use a sauna you start doing that too and you also get out in the sunshine and you also eat healthy and then you also avoid my microplastics and estrogen mimicking chemicals and all that so it compounds you can do a lot better than 25 percent. but testosterone is very measurable and it's very impacted by these uh, these estrogen mimicking chemicals. So you can kind of use that. If your testosterone is a good level, you're probably your body's probably handling these chemicals pretty well. You're probably getting them out of your system, or, or you're just not exposed as much as most people. So it's a good place to start. And again, women should also check their testosterone. And the problem with testosterone for men and women, the normal range is not very reflective of health optimization that's true of vitamin d it's true of glucose on and on and on. like there's so many blood tests triglycerides you can't trust the normal range if you want to be optimized you have to have an understanding of the optimal range right like for the for europe the optimal range for triglycerides is below one you know what i mean in american units that's 150 the average american is I'm sorry, the, like you want to be optimized for triglycerides, it's below 85 in American units, it's below one in European units. But the blood test will say like, I don't know, people could check their blood tests for their triglycerides. In America, it says 150. So if you get mm. below 150, your doctor tells you it's fine. Yeah. But you want to be below 85. The research is super, super clear. 85 and below is optimized, right? So there's a huge difference between normal and optimal. And I'm sure you've talked a lot about that with other people. But right. testosterone, of course, is it's it's a classic situation where they've because so many people have gotten low testosterone over the years they've lowered the normal range they just continue yeah. to lower it they just keep telling people they're normal and they're not normal they're low so you have to watch out for that mm. yeah like like other markers like in crp as well i think the normal normal range is like less than one uh, well, it but... should be it should be but well yeah like there are, some blood tests say three for crp <laughs> It's yeah. gotten, it just keeps going up. Yeah, yeah. but it, but optimally, it should be you know as close to zero as possible, <laughs> like zero. Yeah, even exactly. up to zero point zero point two, they find that. Yep. That that's like the lowest risk. So yeah. Exactly. Sure. That's where mine is. Yeah, I'm almost always about zero point two. Yeah. My cholesterol always gets flagged as being high. I've done artery scans. I have zero plaque in my arteries. Doctors are always telling me I'm going to die of a heart attack. I have zero plaque in my arteries. <laughs> I've no, you know, virtually no inflammation. What a, as far as you can tell did you do What's the that? hard hard or soft plaque uh, test both angiogram and cac score yeah mm. um nice and and remember like i used to research cholesterol for five full years of my life that's what i did full time and so i've done a lot of this and it's so predictable you know a lot of people get real concerned about it because one of the things about heart disease is people are afraid of it right because it's very sudden it's it can surprise you and so it's a very, it's a very vulnerable area for people and modern medicine uses that vulnerability, that fear to sell more drugs. You know, they basically tell people if your cholesterol is high, you're going to die of a heart attack. And people say, oh, my cholesterol is high because I eat red meat. And even though I exercise and eat healthy and, and sauna and do all this amazing things, my cholesterol is high. So therefore, I need to take a bunch of drugs for the rest of my life, right? That's how they get you. They get you with the fear mongering, even though it's complete nonsense in a lot of situations. Sometimes it's legitimate, but most of the time it's fear mongering for mm. the sake of making more money on people. Mm. Uh, what What about some other chemicals? Like we mentioned, BPAs, phthalates, mm -hmm. 
the PFAS, the forever chemicals, what are there like things we need to be yeah. like, aware of? Um, there's a bunch of them actually. So oxybenzone is one, like there's a bunch in sunscreen chemical. There's a bunch of chemicals that block sunlight and they put them in sunscreen. Um, like I said, oxybenzone, O X Y oxy, and then benzone is one of them. Avobenzone, avobenzone, benzophena, uh, uh, for methyl benzylene camphor just a bunch of chemicals in sunscreen so watch out for sunscreens if you can't pronounce the chemical it's probably bad or if you don't never heard of the chemical it's probably an estrogenic chemical in sunscreen i would just use zinc you know if people use sunscreen it's okay just make sure it's zinc zinc and coconut oil or something like that that's a legitimately good sunscreen there's nothing wrong with that um or just wear a sun shirt and sun hat and sun gloves you know like there are ways you can physically block the sunshine without putting chemicals on your body. Mm. But it, ironically, the, a lot of those sun shirts are made from plastic materials, right? So then you're back to sweating into plastics, but you know, you're not wearing them every day. Most people aren't. So, and if you're out in the sun all the time, you get used to it. So there's less need for sunscreen if you're out in the sun more frequently anyways. But that's one area that's a really hot area where there's a lot of chemicals. The other one is soy. You know, every scientist agrees that soy acts like estrogen. It has phytoestrogen, plant estrogen. It's called isoflavones. There's another one called genistein. They're super high in soy. Those two chemicals, isoflavones and genistein. And some people argue that it's good for you. Like that type of estrogen is good for you. And some people argue it's bad for you. But at the end of the day, it's just more estrogen. And the problem is when they do population studies with soy, People already have so much estrogen in their body seem that it doesn't do that much because they're already saturated with estrogen from all the plastics and the sunscreen, and the, you know, the drinking plastic bottles and on and on and on, right? The BPAs and the phthalates. So if you add a little bit of soy, it doesn't do that much negative or positive, but it's more estrogen. It's definitely more estrogen. And so I'm not a fan of using soy products. Uh, you know, just be careful for soy. There's no doubt. Like when they, when they do food studies, um, most foods are under 1000 units of phytoestrogen, but soy is over 100,000 units of phytoestrogen. It's not even close. Like it's, it's in the totally different ballpark. So, and I write about this in my book. I give the exact units in my book. I show the exact studies where they measure different foods and things like that. So, you know, I don't remember all the numbers, but I, I know it's it's a massive, massive difference. And I know soy has over 100,000 units of estrogen. So again, like, don't underestimate how problematic that is if you're giving babies soy formula, which is without a doubt estrogenic, um, or if you're drinking soy milk. There? How does say it, it again? How does it get in the soy? Like, is it naturally it's, in the it's soy? natural part of the plant? Right. Yeah. So at least soy has the argument that your ancestors probably were exposed to some of that natural type of estrogen and your gut bacteria can break it down. And there's certain byproducts that when your gut bacteria break it down, they're actually good for you. So there's some interesting kind of back and forth with the soy estrogen, but again, it's estrogen. And we have so much in our culture as it is, we don't need more. The other one is um, atrazine. There's a couple of pesticides that they spray on crops, atrazine and glyphosate that act like estrogen. And so people need to watch out for those too. So there's a lot of different directions. Some of the artificial food colorings um, act like estrogen in your body. Uh, mold can secrete a toxin called xerolenone, Z-E-A is the abbreviation usually, or Z-E-N, xerolenone. Some scientists abbreviate it Z-E-A, some abbreviate it Z-E-N, but that's what it's called, xerolenone. And that acts like estrogen in your body. And that's from mold. So if you have like moldy grains, or if you have mold growing in your basement, or if you have a leaky pipe behind your wall and there's mold, that's one of the toxins. That's one of the problems with being exposed to a lot of mold is it has a chemical that lowers your testosterone and messes with your estrogen, xerolino. So there's a lot of them, right? And again, I wrote, a, I, I in my book, I write about a top 10 list, right? So I don't know what number I'm on here, just listing them off the top of my head, but you know, there's there's a lot of them. Some of them are worse than others. Some of them are more pervasive than others. But my focus is generally identifying the ones we're exposed to every day, not just the ones we're exposed to once a month or something, every day, and figuring out how can we get rid of those ones. And then if you're exposed occasionally, it's not that big of a deal. Mm. Right. 
Gotcha. So what would, uh, let's say, a life, <laughs> like, you know, I guess you can take it in different tiers. What would be like the easy, easiest things to do to de-plastic your life? And what would be like the, the hardcore mode? <laughs> Yeah, I write exactly about that in my book. So in my book, I have three levels. I call it the gold, silver, and bronze plan. Mm. And the bronze plan that I lay out has, you know, the, the affordable options, the things that are really important and they're cheaper, and you should just really make sure to do those. And then the silver plan is a level up from that. And the gold plan is like if you're a pro athlete or somebody or, or if you have a lot of breast cancer in your family and you want to be really strict about avoid Because breast cancer has increased... 250 percent since 1980 wow. and it's not because of awareness people are aware that breast cancer exists so we don't have to raise awareness it's because of these chemicals nobody's raising awareness of the actual chemicals that are triggering the breast cancer right these estrogen mimicking chemicals so you know if you have that in your family you want to be extra strict about avoiding these chemicals things like that and again it's kind of it's probably too much time to get into all the details with all those different plans but i do have those outlined in my book mm, gotcha so you know i mean the easiest things are don't use Enter your water yeah don't use tupper water the tupperware that's made of plastic don't mm -hmm. uh, don't heat it yeah yeah <laughs> but even if it's cold it probably leaches some right yeah it leaches some yeah exactly right. yeah don't i mean liquids in plastics everybody should not be doing that and like nobody should be doing liquids in plastics it's way too much leaching cold hot whatever it's not worth it um and personal care i would say if you're going to focus on the two biggest categories filter your drinking water get rid of all those liquids and plastics if it's a solid in plastic like coffee beans in plastic you're not you don't have to worry too much you know there's not a lot of leaching i mean if you have an option and you can go with something that's not plastic i would say go with something that's not plastic but I mean, if it's liquid, there's much more molecular movement and more transfer into that substance. So liquids and plastics is number one. And number two is personal care fragrances. Way too many people have way too many cheap personal care products that have fragrances that aren't natural at all. They're full of petroleum-based chemicals that are super cheap to produce, and they mimic estrogen in your body. So I would just get rid of fragrances. If you're unsure if it's a safe fragrance or whatever get rid of it and it, there's plenty of good fragrances from essential oils and things like that i don't have any problem with that but most of them are on the market are not that they are petroleum-based cheap garbage that acts like estrogen in people's bodies mm. what about like any supplements or do you get any of those from there as well yeah yeah i mean I think there there are some supplement capsules that have phthalates. You mean like the capsules having phthalates, or you mean something yeah. that helps detox estrogen? Uh, yeah. The, do they contain any of these chemicals? Yeah, I mean it. It is a, it is a thing. Um, it's probably more in the gold level plan of like, right? Not needing to pay attention to for most people. It's such a, you know, it's such a minor thing, but it is there. It's just like clothing, right? Like, and. I, I, I suppose everybody should pay attention to their bedding too, by the way. Like I said before, if your pillowcase is made of polyethylene, you know, polyester, get rid of, like get a get a cotton pillowcase right away. Get something else, maybe silk, like some kind of natural material that you're not breathing in phthalates all night, because again, like that's a cheap thing. You can everybody can afford that. There's no reason you wouldn't want to do that. Right. Gotcha. And uh, I guess one, one more question would be when you go about, quote unquote, excreting these uh, chemicals and plastics, is there like, is it, you know, kind of, you know, what goes in, what goes out so that you can just always excrete them and kind of that, or is it something that you need to be in a certain state with your physiology or something like that? Is there any like, uh, I guess like some sort of protocols you need to follow because you know if you're doing like some sort of liver detox protocol then you need to have you know kind of certain uh, principles and that kind of thing like does it apply here as well or is it just you know like you know any, every time you sweat you're getting rid of them every time you do kind of fasting or yeah. something yeah they, I mean every time you sweat for sure in fact if people want to do the research it's called bus they call it bus studies blood mm -hmm. urine and sweat bus if you look up bus study phthalates or bus study BPA or whatever, you're going to find all kinds of interesting things. You actually sweat out more estrogens than you urinate out. So mm. sweating is the biggest thing. And how you're sweating, I don't care. If it's a sauna, if it's exercising with a lot of clothing on, I don't care. Just sweat. Make sure to sweat. 
but beyond that, I don't think there's any specific extra levels that you have to get into with supplements and things like, I mean, you, people can, and I'm a, I'm a fan of researching that and, um, trying to go the extra mile because again, it's worth it. Most people are exposed to way too many of these chemicals, but I don't think it's necessary. You know, like it might, it might, instead of taking six months to get these chemicals out of your body, it might, you can probably get it down to three months or something like that. But at the end of the day, I'm a fan of just avoiding the chemicals anyways. And whether it takes three months or six months in the big picture of your whole lifetime, it doesn't make that much of a difference to me. So I'm not that concerned about those kind of details, but it, again, there's probably things that's the problem with a lot of research is they don't study things like that. There's no drug, right? If it was a prescription drug, they would have all kinds of studies. They would have all kinds of money they were pouring into it, but because it's a detox protocol, that's basically probably free. There's not a lot of interest and not a lot of research. So I can't say a lot about it. Right. You know, that sort of thing, other than just basic principles of like sweating and exercise and things like that. Definitely do that. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned that, you know, six months to get rid of them. Um, is there a limit how much how much your body can store them? <laughs> like, you know, if you ingest like a credit card every year or every few months, like if you're alive 10 years, how much how many credit cards you have? And obviously some people have <laughs> even more. <laughs> yeah, it's probably a surprising amount. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, no there's, study, probably, I there's no studies in this. <laughs> no, they don't have the total quantities. I think they're getting to that. I bet you in five years they will. Somewhere in the next one to five years, they'll have those studies of accumulation. I mean, they call it bioaccumulation. Even in my book, I talk about that because they've done studies on polar bears in northern Alaska in the middle of nowhere. There's no people. There's no houses. They go up there with airplanes. They they shoot these bears with uh, tranquilizers to put them to sleep. They take samples, they wake back up, they leave, they're fine. Um, those polar bears have phthalates and they have BPA, right? From the ocean, because the ocean is like a blood vessel. It circulates all, it, all those currents circulate all these things. So we're really wrecking our globe in a lot of different areas, especially because they're dumping, China is dumping trash into the ocean and things like that. So it's a real pervasive issue, but yeah, hopefully they do more long-term accumulation studies on the exact quantities and how much, I mean, I'm sure it plateaus at some point, right? It's going to plateau, Yeah, but I don't know the exact answer there. Mm. Yeah. From an environmental side, I have heard some, that some fungi and mushrooms like can degrade. Break down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, true. The problem is if you, if you develop those, number one, they're not natural fungus and natural they're they're not really found in nature so you're do doing genetic modifications to get them to break down plastics and if you develop those then those can kind of get out of hand and start breaking down all the pipes underground and just start mm. getting getting a <laughs> little bit problematic yeah if you teach if you genetically create an organism to break down plastics yeah now you've got a problem everyone. <laughs> yeah because there are there are good uses for plastics like sewage pipes and things like that. Mm. Um, you know, and it's just the way like airplanes have a lot of plastic. There's a lot of plastic in a lot of places that you don't want it broken down. Right. Um, so it's a tricky situation. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, it's a super, uh, fascinating topic and, you know, concerning at the same time, but I hope like people realize that there are still a lot of things they can do and pretty much like should do on a daily basis to uh, reduce and minimize their exposure to these things. Yeah, man. Yeah. And thanks for having me on to talk about it. It has been a while, but I'm glad, uh, glad you circled back. I always, I always point people to you with the intermittent fasting stuff over the years and, you know, and you've got a pretty good audience over there in Estonia. Every time I talk to you, I get a bunch of interest from Estonia. I don't know. <laughs> At least. That's so cool. that's, that's good, man. Keep up the good work. Yeah, you too. Uh, where can people find the book and uh, your services? Yeah, the book is on Amazon. And it's actually right now, it, it just got translated into Korean, in the Korean language and things. Um, so that's exciting. But yeah, it's just everywhere you can find books, I guess, apparently. And my website is called ajconsultingcompany.com. That's where my consulting is, my DNA consulting that I do. And of course, I've, I'm doing YouTube again. Also, I don't do YouTube that much, but I started back up again. Um, so you can find me if you just search my name on there, you can find me there. Gotcha. 
we'll put the links in the show notes and uh yeah it was a uh, great talking with you thanks sam have a good day you too